Okay, my name's Alex, part of the crypto briefing team, one of the best uh, newsletters in the industry. We also have a strong research uh, branch as well called Symmetry, so check us out, cryptobriefing.com. Uh, today I'm having the pleasure to be presenting this panel on um, derivative assets in the world of DeFi investment. And uh, next to me I have these lovely gentlemen, Harmeet from GooseFX, Siddharth Patil from, and excuse the pronunciation, co-founder and uh, CEO at Comdex and Anki Gaur, founder and CEO at EasyFi. So yeah, let's get started. So as a brief introduction, why don't we go one by one, how you guys got into the crypto rabbit hole and what's a bit of your background in the industry? Yeah. Yeah, I can start. Uh, so I uh, probably got my first introduction to uh, Bitcoin probably around uh, 2010, read the Bitcoin white paper, uh, seemed really interesting, uh, a lot of cool concepts there, but of course I was still pretty young, still in middle school, so couldn't fully uh, invest and get in. Uh, but a few years after that, uh, Ethereum came out, and it was around the time I was also entering university, and I was actually going to the uh, you know, same city where Vitalik's from, Waterloo. So uh, yeah, I was able to uh, kind of get my feet wet with Ethereum at that time and learn about smart contracts, the power of money, a uh, really interesting concept, and uh, yeah, just got, uh, got interested, started developing from there, and uh, over the next few years, uh, just kept staying in the space, and uh, around sometime this year, uh, entered into uh, Solana, and uh, now we build on Solana, so we're uh, GooseFX, it's a full suite DeFi uh, platform, offering uh, features such as crypto trading, uh, synthetic assets, uh, we're launching an NFT store uh, next uh, week and a half, and uh, we're also working on single-sided liquidity. Thank you. All right, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm Ankit, representing EasyFi as a founder and CEO for the company. I entered into the space in late 2016, early 17, when the Ethereum thing was really getting uh, out of the bucket. Got introduced to it from uh, a friend from China and since then have built uh, a trading engine for centralized exchanges initially. And while the DeFi was coming on its uh, uh, adoption, and or I would say more in the ideation stage from late 2018, that got us interested into what it is and how it can, it will actually finally roll out. So initially we had a little bit of <coughs> Um, uh, disappointment or I would say disbelief as in how this is going to work but eventually as the industry grew the, the conviction went on going stronger and stronger and ended up founding EasyFi Network which is a, a layer 2 lending infrastructure which finally gets culminated on Ethereum and uh, for different adoption of lending strategies and bringing in efficient uh, capital deployment and utilization. So bringing efficiency to the capital, that's our main motto. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me here. So I'm Siddharth. I represent Comdex as co-founder and COO. So how I got into crypto initially was um, I come from a background of traditional finance, having worked in wealth management and um, you know, investment banking. And I've always seen things happen on the crypto side from the outside and always been interested about how to get involved, how to get uh, interest, I mean, how to just get involved. So in 2017 is when I came in contact with my current co-founders at Comdex and that's how I started getting involved with uh, you know, crypto in a, as a whole. And uh, ever since then is when I made the switch to the good side. And uh, you know, I've been there since 2017 now. And at Comdex now, we're building an ecosystem of solutions um, aimed towards bridging DeFi and CeFi to democratize finance through the space of commodities as a whole. So yeah, I mean, would love to talk more about what we do as the panel progresses, but uh, happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks for these nice introductions. Um, I guess my first question would be, uh, for those who are not very familiar with the term, what are derivatives and what, what are the most um, popular forms of derivative instruments that we can apply, to apply today in, in DeFi that are used on DeFi protocols? 
Okay, so I'll pick that. Uh, so just to introduce de derivatives, essentially in general terms, derivatives are uh, essentially instruments, or I would say it's a, a product in itself which takes its value from an underlying uh, asset, from an underlying position, or from an underlying situation. From uh, So that is what represents a derivative. Now, there are different uses. A lot of people confuse derivatives to just be with futures trading. But that's only one form of derivatives. So everything where uh, there is an underlying backing instrument asset, that, it's, that actually is a derivative. I mean, um, what, that's a great explanation. And one explanation I often like to use with, uh, with noobs about what derivatives is, is I just say that it's a bet between two people about a particular outcome. And then they agree to pay each other out based on the particular outcome of an underlying asset. So it's more or less an agreement between parties holding opposite views on a particular outcome. And then they just agree to pay each other out based on what the outcome of that um, bet turns out to be. Good. Those are very, uh, you know, understanding explanations. Yeah. Um, could you explain what impermanent loss is, and also how can single-sided liquidity pools help in eliminating the risks of in impermanent loss? Sure. So, um, for those of you who are familiar with what AMMs are or automated market makers are, so the way automated market makers work is there are liquidity pools with assets on both sides of a trading pair and liquidity providers are the ones who provide the liquidity on both sides and that pool facilitates the trading between those two assets so impermanent loss as the name says is is a loss that occurs when the relative value of these assets uh, moves and your position needs to be maintained in the same ratio that you provided it initially so in order to maintain that ratio of 50-50 of the assets you provided, despite the movement of the prices, relative prices of the assets, what often happens is the overall value of your liquidity position can actually decline from what it initially, I mean, from what it potentially was if you had just held those assets outside of the liquidity pool. Um, I know it's a little complicated to understand this way, but the term impermanent implies that it's a theoretical loss and it's not realized until you exit the liquidity position. And um, and you only realize it as soon as you exit it, uh, yeah. But that's that's about as uh, the way I see what uh, impermanent loss is. But yeah, anything you guys want to add? Yeah, to? just to sort of add on top of it. So impermanent loss essentially in one form is <coughs> a sell order of your asset into uh, that particular pool where you didn't want to uh, give out, but you since provided liquidity into a particular dex, you tend to have sold off if there is a swap that has happened. While you wanted to ra uh, ride on that particular asset, you provided liquidity, and then somebody came and bought that asset from the pool, so you are left with US dollars. Yes, you, you are left with the equivalent amount number of dollar value, but you didn't want to sell it at any point. You just provided liquidity, and that in a basic form is impermanent loss. Good, good, good. Understood, yeah. Well, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to uh, pick your brain, Harmeet, on like, more on the regulatory aspects of synthetic assets. So it has been known that you know synthetic assets have been taken down from exchanges like Uniswap. What's what's your take on that ahead of you know potential regulatory uh, concerns? Uh, yeah, the regulatory space uh, it's constantly evolving, uh, as everyone here knows. Uh, every country is also different with how they treat equities, securities, crypto, uh, alternate investments, all these other assets. So it is a constantly evolving space. Uh, I, I believe what happened with, uh, with Uniswap, and I believe you're referring to synthetics and the removal of their uh, assets. It's, it's hard to tell right now because uh, there isn't really that much information on what led to those circumstances. but. It, it's possible that there were some regulatory issues, maybe some, you know, just something that uh, was missed. And uh, there are still other protocols that do have these assets, so it's 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 hard to say. Um, you know, the regulatory landscape uh, changes quite quite quickly, and over the next five to ten years, I'm sure we'll see many cycles of evolution. Um, but yeah, I think we're all just constantly watching the space, and I guess uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, just to add to what Harpeet said, I think, uh, and this is just an observation, while we were also trying to do some work with some synthetic assets company in the past, 
the regulatory inconsistencies, which I think, or I would say regulatory concerns that have uh, all of a sudden accelerated, were because uh, we sort of overstepped into the regulated assets and tried to convert them on-chain synthetic assets, which was the stocks and uh, you know the, the fang stocks and all sort of NASDAQ listed assets. So we tried to marry the two, the blockchain as well as the, the, the real world regulated assets too soon. So that is what sort of created a sense of confusion and as well as accelerated concerns on the regulatory issues. However, I think now a lot of companies have taken a step back and they were like, give me a break, let's try and explore it in a more uh, conducive, a structured framework before just jumping on to uh, trying to create synthetic out of anything. So as, as long as the synthetic assets were backed with the crypto thing, they were still being explored. But the moment you started to touch upon the stocks and gold and commodity stuff, that's where the regulators got concerned because that uh, touches upon a very large population as well as the economic uh, structure of a new organization. So it's, you know, touching assets of different nature that brings more of a conflictive side. Yeah, I think right now, because we are all anyways too early from the regulatory framework perspective. So that automatically created a confusion. So while they were trying to solve the situation and the framework related to the crypto assets, we already muddled up and, and mixed up the stocks and, and stuff there. Uh -huh. That sort of, I think, created like, you know, uh, completely started to negating the whole fact that this can be, this can bring more efficiency to the whole ecosystem system and whole process. Good, good, good. Understood. Wanted to jump into the technology side a little bit now and because I know EasyFi is compatible with BSC, correct? Also Ethereum and uh, Polygon. So what about you guys? Um, do you have any in the roadmap? You know, are you planning to be compatible with other layer ones? So currently uh, our protocol is built on Solana. However, uh, as you guys are aware, there are a lot of uh, bridge uh, applications. Uh, wormhole is one, dbridge, all bridge. There are many ways to uh, move assets from one chain to another. And I believe in the future, we will have a lot more cross-chain operability. So I think as time moves forward, it won't matter too much what blockchain you started with. And you will be able to easily and seamlessly move assets from one blockchain to another in order to interact with DeFi, NFT, et cetera. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, for Comdex, we're built on Cosmos SDK. So those of you who are familiar with the Cosmos SDK, it's a fully interoperable um, you know, layer one protocol. And the reason we built on Cosmos is because we fully believe in the inter vision of interoperability because what we're trying to do is bridge DeFi and CeFi. And the way to tap into the larger DeFi ecosystem is by having a layer protocol below that's you know, easily compatible with all the other layer one chains that are out there. So in our roadmap, we have plans to build bridges to the Ethereum ecosystem and then also obviously expand into bigger ecosystems uh, that also exist alongside, which is like Solana, uh, you know, Polkadot and Avalanche and things of those sort as we go along. Uh, but yeah, within the Cosmos ecosystems, all, all the protocols that are built within Cosmos are inherently interoperable, which already allows us to capture uh, basically all of DeFi that's within Cosmos. And um, with some of the bridges that are already being worked on by other protocols to the Ethereum side of things, we'll soon be able to tap into DeFi liquidity of Ethereum ecosystem as well. Thank you. I wanted to leave it open to you guys now to see if there's any alpha or any like uh, updates in the roadmaps or any like uh, useful new updates for the public that they should be aware yeah. of. So essentially, uh, an important part that I would like to refer to here is related to uh, the derivatives and the composability and the very important role that they essentially are going to play in the real adoption and usage or ever, I would say, transforming the financial ecosystems worldwide. And what we call uh, uh, as a liquidity efficiency is, you know, uh, a very important aspect of, uh, uh, first thing is blockchains are composability uh, native. So uh, blockchains, smart contracts, they inherently enable a lot of composability which means that you can freely, without taking permission from other products or uh, projects, you can integrate into their functionalities and build on top of it. And that is the inherent DNA of any blockchain and smart contract system. 
Now the <coughs> trend of going into multiple blockchains is essentially also to bring composability capabilities across blockchains so that today what happened is uh, all these blockchains came up which were either around layer one or are layer one in themselves. So there are all the projects sort of either started to come up on respective chains or projects started to deploy on multiple chains from the perspective of one, giving different, uh, you, uh, getting into different ecosystem user base. The second important part is now the functionality have to go a layer above the blockchain infrastructure. So today the functionality is localized onto the specific blockchains, like somebody is working on Solana, somebody is a lending, lending business on Polkadot, somebody is a lending business on Polygon, BSC, etc. However, the, the core thing is the, the feature stack, the functionality stack have to go a layer above these blockchain stack and then the functionalities have to be able to corroborate between different blockchains. When this comes, so there's this lending basic uh, lending functionality or maybe a swap that is there. Now what happens about the derivatives, the important role that these derivatives which are going to be able to play into the change or bringing in efficiency into DeFi is today the derivatives are lim in, the, in the traditional finance sector, they are limited for that particular organization or people having an access or permission for a particular derivative. For example, if I have to start recognizing a fixed deposit that you may have done with a bank and be able to start to give you loans against it, I will have to have capability to go and redeem that particular fixed deposit in case you default on that loan. Now, but with DeFi, now this FD receipt that you have, fixed deposit receipt, deposit receipt, saving receipt that you have from that particular bank is nothing but a derivative. Now, with this derivative, I as a smart contract, can I can program that in the smart contract that in case you default the loan, it will go and talk to that particular smart contract and redeem the underlying asset. Whereas in traditional finance, this is not possible because the bank may not release you the funds though you are bearing that particular asset because you are not the one who got that particular investment done in the first place. Now this particular thing when gets opened up with the uh, uh, LP tokens which we call LP tokens are also a form of derivatives which are derivative of a position or an investment. Now the, these LP tokens essentially are becoming more and more powerful and making the whole DeFi ecosystem more fluid with the liquidity and bringing in efficiency to be able to use them, trade them or you know, <coughs> uh, lend them for different purposes. Now this is the most important part that sort of uh, creates the, uh, the foundation of DeFi 2.0. Nice. Um, so yeah, Siddharth, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, very well put by Ankit. Uh, you know, the impact of derivatives on traditional finance was to democratize finance for those involved in traditional finance. And I think what synthetics will do or what derivatives on blockchain will do is basically democratize DeFi for DeFi users, um, giving them access to assets that they traditionally have to go through a lot of hurdles to get to. Um, and, and I think that's the underlying theme of the movement with derivatives and DeFi. Um, and speaking of alpha, you know, with Comdex, we're doing um, our own synthetics protocol, which is focused on commodity synthetics, giving DeFi users access to commodities, taking exposure to commodity assets and commodity debt um, from traditional finance. So we had our mainnet go live uh, on the 20th of November, and we're listing on Osmosis, um, Osmosis decks in the Cosmos ecosystem uh, pretty soon, which is around 24 hours from now. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of exciting updates coming from us, and we also had an airdrop uh, that we conducted recently. So all this information can be found on, on the Comdex website, which is comdex.1. So yeah, head over there and check out everything that we're up to, and, and feel free to drop by to our booth if you have any more questions for us. Thanks for sharing. And Harmit, do you want to share any updates in your project? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, we've uh, been pushing out quite a, quite a lot of features, and we're going to be launching most of those features over the next quarter as well. Uh, our social media is GooseFX and GooseFX1 on Twitter. So uh, if anyone wants to keep up to date with uh, our, our roadmap updates, we also have a Medium article. And uh, our Discord is very active. So uh, yeah, that's where most of us uh, spend our time is on the Discord. So yeah, feel free to stop by and uh, yeah, just update yourself and just follow through with our roadmap. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I wanted to leave it open to the public to see if any of you guys have any questions for the panel. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello. Um, 
Yeah, so I was going to see, you know, do you see any type of, um, I don't necessarily know if like moral hazard is the word to it, but when you start creating synthetics um, and this kind of stuff in crypto uh, for retail traders, like is there any type of like edge? Can you hear it? Oh, a little bit closer. Oh, okay. So I don't know if the uh, if necessarily the word like moral hazard is there, but as you start creating, um, you know, synthetics and you know this kind of stuff that would almost be representative of, like of CDOs back in the day, is there any type of risk to retail traders as you start creating this stuff that is you know getting more and more abstract, where people might not even realize what they're buying or trading or the risk that goes with it? So I don't know if I fully caught what you yeah. said because of the audio, but I'll just yes. try to guess guess your question. So I think uh, when it comes to the moral risks about synthetics, is, I think that's what you were asking, right? In terms of the risks for investors. So yeah, I mean, the primary purpose of derivatives is to allow people to hedge or to leverage or to speculate. And um, all of these things have inherent risk associated with them. When you're hedging your positions in the real world against, let's say, a derivative of the same position, uh, you obviously stand the risk of things not going the way you planned, and then you suffer the losses from not getting your hedge right. Same thing with leverage. When you leverage up on any of your positions, uh, sure, the upside multiplies when you're leveraging up. But then when you face the downside as well, it also multiplies. So that's the same kind of risk that you face. And speculation is speculation, right? Um, anyone who gets involved with speculative positions on any kind of asset should be prepared for uh, movements on both sides, which is upwards and downwards. So yes, to some extent, there is risk involved. But I think uh, I believe investors uh, who get involved in complex assets like derivatives should have a perception of the, the risk before, obviously, that they get involved into it. Would you like to add anything to that? No, I completely yeah. agree with what Sid said. Essentially, uh, the blockchain and the ecosystem brings in the, the fluidity and ability to do all that. However, the risks, they do definitely exist when you talk about hedging. So as long as the strategies are being there, are being done, uh, uh, used properly, that, that's how you can only manage it. Mm -hmm. Good. Does anyone? Yeah. Go ahead. So, we touched on um, the regulatory aspects of this and it seems particularly relevant in DeFi. I'm curious, I mean, obviously you guys aren't anonymous. What do you think about founders taking the anonymous route? So I'm familiar with a few protocols, you know, that have done pretty well and have, you know, completely anonymous teams, anonymous founders. Um, I think a lot of it just has to do with the nature of the product that you're working on. Sometimes the merit of the product is, is based on the team and the merit of the team that's building it. And sometimes the product strength is in not knowing who's behind it uh, due to the nature of the product. So typically, I think privacy-based protocols you see a lot of times are built by anonymous teams. Um, to some extent, it's, it's part of the inherent requirement of the product that nobody knows who's really building it because it should just be a decentralized product that's being built by contributors who you don't know who, where they sit, what they do, but they contribute and you can see their work in the code and not in who they are. Yeah, so it, it definitely is to do with the product that you are building and essentially the, the path, the eventual roadmap of the particular product that one look at. So there are things that in a way you are nurturing the baby and then handing it over to the community. On the other hand, the other path is that you, in, since the beginning itself, just get the baby out in, in there while you're, you're nurturing it as part of the community. So these are two different models, have their own pros and cons. Great, great, thanks for that. Well, this has been a very interesting speech and thank you for all three and Kit, Siddharth, and Armit for being here. And um, yeah, why don't we give them a big applause? Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.